I would now like to introduce the members of our panel discussion, um, the future of design. Been very much looking forward to this discussion, as I hope you have been. Um, we all know that AI is rapidly creeping into our creative lives. In this discussion, our panel of experts will share varied perspectives on how generative AI will improve impact the practice, ethics, and value of creativity in a digital world. I'd like to welcome back Elliot Brown, who's presented earlier this morning, um, who's representing graphic design. Also welcome back Afri Ashraf Ghori, who presented on comics this morning and re will represent illustration industry. I'd also like to welcome Razan Takash, a film writer, director, and producer and Fiona Robertson, who is a media lawyer at OSN, representing the law side of using AI. The panel will be moderated by Afroz Noaf, head of our Middlesex Film uh, Studio here at Middlesex University. And you will have time to ask questions at the end of the discussion. So once again, please put them in the Q&A session and we'll put those to the panel members. For now, um, please welcome all our panel members and Afros, I will pass the uh, emceeing over to you. Thank you, Margot, thank you very much. Um, all right, good afternoon uh, to all of you and, and thank you to all my panelists for joining today. Uh, today's panel discussion is on the transformative power of AI in creativity. And you know, as we navigate through the realms of film, graphic design and the broader implications of copyright law, we find ourselves at a pivotal moment in the evolution of creative expression. And today we're here not only to explore the remarkable advancements AI bring to our industries, but also to critically reflect on how we as creators engage with this technology. Um, you know, as a film and design professor myself, but my stance on AI is grounded in the belief that these tools should not be seen as a crutch that hinders our creative thinking. Instead, I advocate for a synergistic approach where AI acts as a catalyst that amplifies our ability to think, ideate, and innovate. In this dialogue today, we're joined by our distinguished panelists who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience from the field of graphic design, illustration, film, and copyright law. And, and I've curated some questions uh, across all the fields that we covered today. And as we explore these topics, I encourage all the panelists to share their insights and perspectives uh, freely. Let's start with uh, a temperature question. Uh, you know, uh, let's take, do you believe that integration of AI in your respective fields represent a threat to the traditional creative role or do you see it as an invaluable tool that enhances the process? Uh, Elliot, thank you for joining us today. Let's start with your perspective on this question. Um, yeah, I think to begin with, threat at this stage is not something that I necessarily see. I think um, if if I if I look at a way that we sort of smiled at it in the studio when there was the addition of AI generative generative logos, and you could put in a prompt around what you wanted it to be, and we sort of had a look at that in the studio and quickly realized that we were safe for now. Um, but no, I think one of the things we sort of, one of the tasks I sort of looked at myself and my team were to do was, and I think you've been using this word a lot there in your intro is to actually look at it as tools. Um, you know, on a daily basis, we generally will use a lot of software that allows us to progress concepts into actual usable assets for our clients. So things like Adobe, uh, Illustrator, Photoshop, uh, et cetera, XD, and so on and so forth. They're all digital-based tools that, you know, help streamline workflows for us uh, and, and allow us to create uh, outside of pen, paper, uh, and drawings, et cetera. So when we start to look at some of those assets, one of the biggest changes that, you know, very quickly that came about was Adobe's introduction with the generative um kind of tool that they used within Photoshop as opposed to Illustrator. We found that incredibly useful in terms of uh, image generation uh, from a basic level of being able to extend images when it's not quite wide enough with a background scene or, you know, whether there was something, you know, a little bit different or strange and wonderful that we wanted to create from a completely made up, um, you know, Adobe uh, Firefly or something like that. 
So on a creative side, I see it, there's a there's an ability for it to uh, potentially enhance. There's automation that can be in there in terms of generation of color palettes, uh, typographic choices. Yeah. Um, there's even tools out there from a copyright perspective that you can now do quicker digital searches around um, you know, the, the bespokeness of any given kind of identity system. And, but going back to even something I was talking about this morning, we also use the tool for that substance aspect of it. The, the, the thinking, the, the strategic insights that we can gain from using something like a, you know, chat GBT, or, uh, I think Google just renamed their bar to Gemini where you can actually, you know, as long as you it's about the prompts, right? So the AI is only as good as I think the information you can feed into it personally is what I believe. So if you can ask the right questions, you can gain incredible insights around, you know, um, competitors, their positionings, uh, understanding where they are and what they're doing. Um, and you can gain valuable insights around some of the strategic sort of foundations that we would want to have in place when utilizing that into any brand creation process. So I think for me at this stage, it's, it's so new. Uh, it's about seeing how we can use them as tools to enhance the output to deliver better for our, you know, partners and clients that we are here and working for. Thank you very much. You know, uh, just when you said the firefly part, I remember looking at it and thinking, oh my God, the hours that I've spent, because I started my journey as a graphic designer too, the hours I have spent mapping and remapping things. I'd like to follow, I mean, give you a quick follow-up question on that. I know there are a lot of people because, you know, from a perspective of using AI, there's a lot of exploration going on, but very little of actual execution. There's a thin line that's kind of separating everyone going from that exploration to execution stage. How much would you say that you are currently implementing with these tools in the market? At what percentage are you now using these to ship your products out? Uh, minimally, I would say, um, just through probably the workflows that we have more than anything else and understanding them. I think like you've just touched on there, Firefly, pre this conversation today, I sort of did a joke input to see if it would generate a, a image of my black French bulldog in the rain in Dubai. And lo and behold, I get five different images and there's no practical use to that, but it is quite fun. Um, I think probably uh, from a strategic point of view, I think uh, ChatGPT and, and Gemini are incredibly useful tools to gain really quick insights um, and understandings that can help focus briefs and, uh, and even workshops with our clients. So, that has been a bit of a game changer just because it takes it a step much further beyond a Google search and actually is able to give you quantitative kind of data that can really impact that thinking. I think from the creative side, it's more, uh, it's, it's definitely more minimal because it's about sort of enhancing. It's about, you know, like I say, images might not have enough space for us. So we want to generate a wider background to be able to apply something to it. Um, we still generate things like 3D models uh, through us building them. And I know that there'll be a stage at which that will be able to be automated, which would be great and a, a huge time saver. And I think if there's ways we can take, save time, I see it at that. So uh, the, sh the short answer is a little bit at this stage, but I see that growing over time as the tools, I think, kind of refine themselves and almost find their you know, their uses within different industries and, and, and the ways that we can understand them. Cause it's just like, they've gone, here you go. And we've got to go, okay, well, how do we use it? And I think we've got to find those sort of uh, ways and means to, to enhance what we do. So. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, and now on to Brazan, uh, a we're neighbors. And of course we have a, a bit of overlap in our path with both academia and our own practices so I'm um, I'm really interested to know what's your take on all things AI from all the perspectives that you're currently tackling. Hi neighbors. <laughs> well, uh, I would say that the most essential thing to understand about AI when it comes to film uh, is it's not uh, what AI can do; it's who is using it to do what. It's really about uh, whose hands is it falling into. Uh, AI can be just like any other advance in technology in the history of cinema. It can be a wonderful tool uh, to make our work more efficient, uh, to actually support um, the craft that is 
quite difficult anyway. <laughs> can you use all the all the kind of facilitation it can have? Um, but it is it has become very controversial, not because of what it does, but because of who's trying to use it. Uh, and when you try to use technology to replace uh, the human element, especially the creative element, this is when it becomes a problem. Uh, and we see it, we saw it cause a problem with all the strikes that happened in Hollywood for the actors and the writers because AI was suggested to be something that would replace uh, actors, uh, which is unfathomable. You know, there was a very controversial um, uh, clause in the uh, in their in the new deal that they were doing with the producers guild which is that an extra can be filmed and they'd be paid for only that day of shooting and then their image would belong to that studio forever to be used in ai and they wouldn't even be paid from that that's nuts that's <laughs> that's crazy uh so things like that however for filmmakers it's the same thing as when we moved from film to digital like editing film used to be quite difficult and time consuming and transferring to digital once we started using machines the the skill changed the basics are still the same but the skill itself of using you know editing software versus physically editing it evolved and it evolved the the skillsmen the the artists and it also opened up the door for them to do even more within their craft but if you at the time when we were doing film and somebody was like oh we have a software now anybody can edit and then you got somebody who was not an editor to edit. He's going to do a bad job and he's going to replace somebody who's essential. So that will hinder the creative process. It will actually have a dire effect on the craft itself. So again, it's who has the buttons to the nukes. It's, not, <laughs> it's who has who's holding the steering really is, is how we can identify the effect of AI. Okay, and 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 thank you for the little nuke joke there. Applies, I guess, very well. Uh, and and from the perspective of academia, how are you approaching the subject? Because I, I'm sure we both face this on our daily on a, on a daily basis, where students are using these tools to cut corners rather than the full potential of it. Are you already from an, from a perspective of running the department at SAE already thinking about this, or are you having discussions around it, or is it already integrated or too late? Uh, it's definitely a nightmare. I'm not going to lie, uh, because just as the people up top, as in the execs and the people who have money want to do shortcuts, people at the bottom or students and, and rising and without enough experience also want to do shortcuts. And if it's used, again, just to shorthand the process, then it's a problem. It definitely can be used as a tool. Uh, at SAE, we are quite strict with the use of AI. We consider it, if not referenced properly, uh, then it's considered plagiarism and then it's treated as if it's plagiarism. However, there are certain aspects, I can't speak to the other departments, but for the film department, uh, we, if students want to use AI, they kind of have to pitch it. They have to pitch how they're using it and they have to reference the use uh, properly and then maybe they are allowed to. And then that, again, just if they're going to digitize something, for example, some art and the design, production design, things like that, that can help uh, their project, elevate their project. Again, if you use AI as a supporting tool, it can be great. But if you use it to cut corners or replace processes or replace people, then it's a problem. Uh, and and from your perspective, let's say you as a, as a director or filmmaker or any other aspects that you're attacking uh, from that perspective, when do you see endorsing it or where do you see it coming the most useful to your work, especially for indie filmmakers? There are areas, for example, storyboards from struggling to find, you know, uh, uh, elements for other aspects. It, it really does act as a tool to kind of give you that push, that initial push to run. So where do you see uh, uh, it being integrated in your personal journey? Yes. Uh, it is quite helpful in uh, not in the filmmaking process itself, but the, the tool that I personally really uh, think it's the most helpful for us filmmakers because we well, we're, we're crazy and we're not great communicators most of the time. And it's very hard for us to bring out what's in our heads and put it on the table for everybody else to understand. And I think one of the best things that I've experienced recently is the use of mid journey for that for conceptualization uh for storyboarding like you said for example we just uh, shot a film it's a post-apocalyptic film that we shot in jordan 
And it's quite a big project. It's a 25 minute film. It's high budget. It's a genre. And it was very tough raising the money. It took us five years uh, of trying to raise the money. And we finally shot it last year. I've been working on it since 2018. And we needed money. And the traditional um, uh, platforms were difficult to approach for financing because it's a genre movie and they tend to support drama and things like that. So we needed to go elsewhere. So if I'm going outside of the film industry trying to get an investor or to get a sponsorship, these people are not filmmakers. They're not going to read a script and understand and see. So we used a lot of uh, mid-journey to create visuals. We also did crowdfunding and we created visuals that we can use in the crowd for things that can sell the idea to people and represent what we have in our heads. One of the biggest things that actually worked out for us is that we approached an energy drink for uh, a product placement deal where they would place a product in the film and they'd give us money for the product, but, but it can't be like an ad, it has to be part of the story. So we ha we couldn't film that for them to convince them. And it's been very hard to convince people of product placement until I use Midjourney. And it, it's a post-apocalyptic survivor story. So the man uses yeah. the tin cans in the building of his uh, house and where he lives and things like that. He's in a cave. So it's integrated. He grows plants out of it. So we, I couldn't sketch. I'm not. And even if you sketch, it's not the same. So we used Midjourney and we took their can and we placed it in the storyboards of the film. And we sold them on the idea and we managed to get the money out of them. So again, it's really in that prep work, I think, because preparation for film is insane and it requires just hours and time and hands and AI can be a great tool for that for pre-production work and things like that imagine what we can do with budgeting and scheduling moving forward but you still need a producer on top to make these decisions but AI can streamline the process much better and get us to do things more efficiently and open the door for more creative work because we're not you know dying for money and time Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I agree with many of your parts and, and you know, we've also incorporated uh, Midjourney and, and you know, uh, Dali into our curriculum as well, where they're churning out, uh, especially in the planning phase. But I also do agree to the point that there should be uh, uh, someone overseeing the process to make sure that you, you're extracting the exact element that you want in there. Uh, and and uh, of course, um, like you said, for indie filmmakers, it's definitely definitely a helpful tool to kind of move, move things along and you know like you said imagine things not everyone's a blessed sketch artist to come up with concepts so yeah sure thank you thank you very much for sharing that and i want to move on to i definitely have i see i see you know uh, um, you know i had a point where i wanted to take through the narrative process so maybe hopefully uh you know you're all able to connect everything that we're bringing together uh, first of all, Ashraf, I'm super, super happy to see uh, you on the sheet. I don't know if you remember this, but during my HP days, CGI and 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 Wakas, you you guys used to churn out insane amount of assets for us. And I think I still have the book, your first right. illust was... illustrated illustrated book with me. So good to see you again. No, uh, thank you. Thank you for joining today. Uh, now, given your let's say. Um, experience how are you currently navigating the intersection of ai with with traditional artistic methods and how do you, is, is it been better has it made your job easier or do you think it's a newer way to go through about go about the thought process yeah i think i'm in agreement with most of the panelists over here uh where we're we're being pragmatic about it and it's not a doomsday scenario it's it's something that is helping our uh our everyday uh life and I, I think uh, it was really ridiculous when uh, it was announced uh, or the early days where the comic uh, community, especially like started saying, say no to AI. And they, they started changing their, their profile pic. And uh, it was all just uh, doom and gloom. But uh, for me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, you know, if, if any of you all know me, I have always been vocal about uh, adopting uh, new tech and and using it, and uh, and that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm actually implementing it within my work um, uh, workflow, and that's the it's it's been nothing but useful. You know, there's it's, it's never come to a point where it's uh, overbearing or uh, it's it's a it's a threat like you had mentioned earlier. But then uh, it's it's something that that is uh, of constant benefit and i'm actually using some of these these elements to include to incorporate into my uh my working pipeline 
So to end of the day, we want to do create the work faster and more efficiently. We only have like these many hours. And if we can shorten our uh, work day, well, hey, why not? Yeah, I mean, uh, but let me ask you the same question again. Uh, from exploration to implementation, all right? How much do you say of the workflow is it currently taking? I also know you are a forward thinker. You also pretty much endorse technology from, from a perspective that you see it as an accurate tool for you to run faster. I know this, not having known you for a couple of years now. Uh, so how do you see this being implemented? Like at what percentage are you currently at? And at what point would you take that to a higher percentage? Okay. Uh, from a practical standpoint, I say I'm at 50-50 at this point, which is very good um, because it's it's helping me quite a bit. Uh, and I think the future of creative work is going to be 50-50. You need to put in your initial input and let AI maybe take in um, further. There's a there's there's some technology now where where people are are coming up with simpler. Uh, sketches or or 3d renders simple blocky shapes and the command prompt is taking care of the rest and we're talking about like 3d animation real real time so this is this is exactly where i see it's it's headed where there's going to be a healthy mix of the creator input the creative input coming in from the artistic side and then ai will take it further so i i have uh been experimenting with a new technology called uh, Magnific, which is an AI upscaler. Um, I'm one of the uh, uh, so the 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 one the guy who created this. It's it's sort of burst onto the scene and it's really uh, catching on fast. Could you give us so, the the name of the the URL so that we can put it for our uh, put it into the chat box for the audience? What is it called again? Um, I'm not sure what the URL is, but it's Magnific AI. Okay. Thank you. Right. So it's an AI upscaler. What it does is when you come up with a low resolution image, it adds in the detail that you want to see. Uh, the, the, you know, it's, it's some nuanced detail, which makes it uh, the final product, not just a high resolution image, but AI is filling in the gaps. So for yeah, example, so pretty much, looking at... I would say pretty much, I think, uh, uh, overlapping with Firefly. And I think Firefly is running at like... Every, not, not, like... not exactly, not exactly. Okay. Because uh, like, for example, if you have an uh, image of a garden and you have mm -hmm. these really blurry leaves, it's, it's actually adding definition to the leaves. It's actually creating more leaves. It's actually uh, giving you elements what would happen inside a garden. So so it's it's actually interpolating in a way which where there's input in there as well. So this is something um, uh, I think it's a very uh, exciting new technology. It's definitely going to uh, to be a big part of the, uh, I think Adobe and everyone would most likely start implementing this, this kind of AI and not just standard upscaling. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And and I think that brings us to the exact intersection where I wanted to actually bring this point. I can see Fiona smiling from there. Uh, talking about the 50-50 integration artist and, and you know, AI coming in handy, how do you think from your perspective and your viewpoint and everything that's unfolding around you, uh, um, are you for it? Are you are you seeing this as an opportunity or a challenge? Um, and, and how do you think uh, everything evolving from an intellectual property manner as well? Um, so, so um, obviously sitting at a, a broadcaster, we don't have a huge view about AI in particular. Um, our view is always that content is content, good content is good content, and bad content can be created by humans as well as by machines. Um, we're always looking for good content. And if AI can make and help people get there at a lower cost, faster, and in a more efficient way, I'm all for it. Legally, of course, it does present some difficulties. And I think... I think one of the things that's causing a lot of a lot of the questions amongst creatives that are using AI is the fact that we've got multiple cases coming out of multiple jurisdictions that are saying the same things in some places, different things in others. So you've got the US at the moment, which I have to add is an incredibly conservative 
jurisdiction when it comes to granting copyright protection because they're one of the few jurisdictions that requires you to do a registration with the Copyright Office. And the Copyright Office is a pretty conservative beast at best of times. So they're rejecting applications and you will have seen probably a couple of cases. There was a, a fairly famous um, animation. It was a comic book, I think, called Zaria of the Dawn. It was one of the early AI cases. The gentleman who created that particular comic uh, book popped it in for copyright registration and they accepted it initially thinking that he had done it. But when they realized that AI had contributed a huge percentage of the content, they then took the copyright registration away from him. And what they did say at that time was that they would be perfectly happy to register those bits that he could identify as original material. And we've had a couple of cases since then where people have refused to, 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 to say, I did this bit, the machine did that bit, because they're trying to get a view from the Copyright Office about the totality of the registration, and that's not been forthcoming. So that's the US register, and that's kind of, you know, you know, that's the US. That's just one country. We tend to look at it. They tend to be quite newsy and a bit blabby about what they do, but that is only one country. In the UK, the only couple of cases I've seen have been very low-level creatives, and I think you have to kind of remember that um, Low-level creativity, whether it comes from a human or a machine, is not going to be copyright registrable because uh, it's not creative enough. You have to have creativity. And going right back to, you know, to a million years ago when we used to have phone books, people used to try and claim copyright in phone books. And you'd be like, that's not original. It's just a list. We've got that same issue coming in with AI as well because a lot of that low-level stuff is being created by machines and people are trying to claim copyright in it. It's probably not going to work. But just to make things even more confusing, just coming out of China this week, and China is obviously not a jurisdiction everybody looks at, but it is an interesting jurisdiction from a copyright perspective because they're really rubbish at copyright protection. Um, J.K. Rowling has tried to sue people there for years for um, the, the the fake Harry Potter books that they've been putting out in Chinese, and it's it's been a struggle for her. But this week, last week, maybe it was last week in China, a case came out where the, co the courts did assign 100% protection to an AI generated image. And the reason the courts did this, and, and, and when you think about the, the process of creativity, you can see the reasoning of the courts is that the gentleman involved in the creation did an incredibly specific prompt but he didn't just do one prompt. Once he got the image, he kept going and kept going and kept going. To, and he did over 120 different prompts to create the exact image that he wanted to present as, as his artistic piece. And you can see that that is an incredibly different process to just typing in Fiona Robinson, lawyer, Dubai, and up, you're going to get my face because of the training of the of, of, of the beast. So you're going to see me. So this guy put an incredible amount of, of, of personal effort and creativity into it, tweaking tiny little pieces of the AI and in essence using the tool as a pen rather than a, a, ge a generative piece of, of, of software. And they gave him copyright protection. So you can see we're still at a point around the world where, where we, we are waiting for the big decision that tells us everything we need to know. And just adding to that, I think we have to remember that machine creation is never going to be in and of itself. It's not going to be copyrightable. And we know that because of the monkey case. If you all maybe remember the monkey who took the selfie, um, it must be about eight years ago. It's one of my favorite all-time cases. He stole a camera from a photographer. He took a selfie of himself. The selfie went viral. Everyone wanted to put it in calendars. And Peter tried to get rights for the monkey so that the monkey could get the money from that. And that didn't work. So if a monkey can't get copyright, then I don't think a machine can either. Uh, th thank you so much for that. I think it kind of transitioned into the next question. I mean, ultimately, I, I believe it all comes down to the industry as well and, and, and the forward thinking nature of the industry in itself. Because uh, if you look at the digital art side in the blockchain and, and the NFT side, you, you can see that there's a completely different uh, reception out there where the assets are now tangible value. Like I've seen you know, uh, generative AI stuff that, that went from, uh, I would say like $5 to $20,000 and people actually creating these things. And it also comes back to the intersection of what you just mentioned as well. It's, it all, it's not just about one prompt. It's about the 50, 70, 80 prompt that people need to like refine and refine. That is very much about the thought process of the artist himself, 
than just AI spitting out information. I guess that brings me to my uh, 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 next question where it's, do you think that there is a need to redefine what constitutes an author in the digital age? Or do you think legal frameworks should adapt to address the question of authorship in the current digital age and I've, everything that's happening around I, it? I, I will say from the start that the legal systems are always quite slow at catching up with technology and its advances. And if you have a look at any of the really early internet cases, you can see the way the court is trying to get a concept and push it into the technology box so that it can work in a way that they find logical. So I think it'll take another couple of years before we, we do get to where creatives will want it to be. I don't think machines will will get copyright so much but I think what will happen is that there will be a dilution of the copyright um, to the percentage that you're not creatively involved so you know if you've done 50% effort you get kind of 50% protection I think that's probably more likely but the other thing I think is that we need to look at as well is the way that that AI is training and the kind of material that it's using for training and how that impacts on people's rights as well and I think that too those two are very powerful dynamics that work against each other it's it's protection protection for people who have already created versus protection for people who wish to create using using those historical creative pieces um I think that that's going to cause a lot of tension uh, in in the way that the legal system has to deal with it because we need to address both of those rights it's very important um, you know, you can't move forward without looking back, but at the same time, you know, looking back, that's all that AI does is look back. It trains on what exists, not on what it will exist tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you. And, and I would, and, and one more follow-up question, what mm -hmm. advice would you offer to creators and artists in protecting their works? Mm -hmm. Because to their replication styles and gener generating similar content, you know, mm -hmm. everything's out there. Are traditional IP protection sufficient or should new measures be considered? Look, it's a really difficult question. I always, I, I often get calls from photographers who've had their beautiful photos of a sunrise over the Dubai skyline taken and popped in a book or, or stuck on a on a calendar. It happens far too often. And it is really, really difficult to protect your rights. No matter how you generate work, it is difficult. Um, there's a process of registration that you can go through, but that's not necessarily proof of originality. So what I always say to people is to be very um, uh, diligent in writing down your influences, the reasons why you made it purple, the reason why it's round, the reason why the pro the story progressed this way, the reason why you placed, thinking about your influences, writing them down. And when it comes to AI, like you keep a record of your prompts, keep a record of how you got to where you are. Because if, you're, if your prompts quite clearly show original thought, then you're going to have a better process and a better ability to defend that rather than putting in, you know, uh, rainy day in Dubai, Picasso stuff style and as soon as you put in Picasso style you're coming into the world of derivatives so you have you know you're not, that original thought kind of falls away um, it's harder to argue so I always say to people you know keep a creative diary it's such a simple thing to do but when you're creating something like what where did this come from where did this idea come from you know when you were sitting in the car in the rain and you saw the girl in the yellow dress and then you knew that was the thing that you needed to add to this project write it down and that everything that you write contemporaneously is extremely helpful in defending things later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that last bit was uh, uh, um, people are thinking because I know that there's discussions happening all around the world about tracking your prompting, especially from the perspective, see if, you know, if your style is being appropriate. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Another question for Elliot. Uh, because it's the it's it's that design fest, and a lot of our students might be thinking about this as well. And I'm sure, uh, uh, from a branding perspective, how how can AI tools, for example, contribute or detract from creating a brand's identity? Speci specifically, talking from a perspective of emotionally resonating with consumers. <laughs> Good question. I think it's, um, I think like what, uh, you know, we've all been talking about around here, it, it all comes back, back down to how you control it as a tool. 
So there's a lot of low hanging fruit. You know, if if we were to do and utilize AI to create, say, um, a basic logo for a, and that's probably a good way to do this, a basic logo for a cafe, you may get an output that's a usable asset as a logo, but that doesn't make a brand, okay? And I think that's the thing to remember. And it's it, it, it's it's building around, well, what is brand and how do we create it? And it's so much more than the, 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 the visual aspect of the brand. So the tools out there are usable within the sense. And as I'd sort of mentioned earlier, we we certainly use them for the research part of it and, and the, the strategic foundations part of it, which is what feeds into then our creative process and utilizing that thinking as a lens to create. And I think, you know, if you were to use it to then take that information and use that to direct your prompts, you may get a better output than coffee shop um, in the lakes, for instance, or something like that. Because if you've defined audiences, you've defined positioning, you've defined your purpose and you've defined your, you know, your basic nuts and bolts and tools of what the brand is about and you've defined how you want your tone of voice to be, if you haven't done that, then your output from AI is going to be very basic and general. And, you know, you, you would end up looking like everybody else out there and probably our biggest task to do when creating anything graphically for our clients. And when we're building brands is to make sure that we're completely differentiated to anything that's out there. So I think, you know, it's our task to make sure that that is the case. And I still think I haven't seen anything yet in the creation of brand that makes me think, you know, I'm out of a job tomorrow. I think it's very much seeing um, tools that can enhance, enhance kind of workflows, um, create efficiencies in how we output. You, you touched on one that's a great one in terms of, you know, cutting out of images, hours spent in that. It's a click of a button now. That's that's a that's a game changer in terms of workflow. But in terms of end product, I still believe, and I could be wrong, and it probably might change in a very quick period of time. But I still believe that as humans over AI, we are better placed to create stronger outputs at this stage um, as 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 a tool. It's still sort of in its infancy. Awesome, thank you. And 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 another uh, question to add to that: If you were, let's say, given um, access to AI when you were in your say final year at college how would you approach the subject and with the experience that you currently have and the understanding that you have how would you uniquely incorporate that into your practice right now as a young creative experimentation i think uh everything and anything with the biggest way i learned at, at, at college and then university at art college we got a, a really kind of wide experience of fine art ceramics photography uh, graphic design, fashion design. I was terrible at that. Um, but what it what it sort of opened you up to is this idea of experimentation and where concepts and thinking can kind of come from and, and be an inspiration. So in those formats and in those disciplines, we were always encouraged to break the rules, try different things and, and just play around with what possibilities could be. And I think because you know, students are probably best placed. Uh, if I always feel that being a little bit older, that I'm, I'm always playing catch up as these generations and these new sort of tools and assets. Each time Adobe has a new release, there's another new way to do it, and I'm probably still there doing, you know, Control C and trying to draw things around it, and and being a lot more kind of labor intensive than I probably need to be. Um, so I think it, for me, uh, you know, the, the advice would be to 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 play with it and and see what the possibilities there are in a way that it can potentially enhance. Um, I don't think it should ever replace and I don't, th- it should never be the default, but I think it's, you know, uh, uh, again, using the word tool, seeing it as a tool, um, it's only going to continue to evolve. It's only going to continue to um, further move into our uh, our creative realms and our worlds. And I, and I think it's just finding ways that it becomes really useful to creating a better output at the end of it so i i would say experimentation have fun play around see what it can do um and then where that could take you in in terms of a journey thank you thank you and and uh to razan um i know sometimes the hardest point as in 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 your in a filmmaker's life is to get that idea out in terms of writing especially in the writing process a lot of time is spent on 
you know, thinking and, and coming up with connections before you sit. And it's always the reason, right? Yeah, I'm still thinking about my story. I'm still connecting my story. Do you ever see this becoming a part uh, from a perspective of it being major help, uh, especially to find, to make sure the authentic voice and vision stays? But do you think AI would play any part in that process of storytelling? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't. Uh, the thing about ideation is that it's uh, it's something out of nowhere, right? It's uh, it's creative. Uh, yes, we are heavily influenced by everything that we've seen before. Uh, but generally, the starting points come from somewhere deep. The thing that so far, and again, we're talking about the current technology. I don't know what will happen later. But the way that AI, especially something like ChatGPT, is right now, is that it is not creating anything new. It is mainly uh, taking in influences from what already exists uh, and combining it into something that is safe and digestible. Uh, and it's really the, it's like, it, it cannot go more than first or second dimension of what that concept is. Um, and the thing is, if you want to tell authentic, diverse stories, uh, ChatGPT won't find enough of them to create uh you know to create something it will always uh go to the what already exists the most so it's pretty much what we already know uh just a regurgitated version of that now what to help with ideation and use it as a tool that is definitely something you can do like one of the things we we did in a workshop with ai is actually come up with an idea is building and designing characters and then prompting uh, uh, mid journey or uh, or um, or even chat GPT for the images to create visuals of people as inspiration for types of characters, combining two different archetypes together and see the kind of images we get. Uh, same thing for locations because we are visual artists, filmmakers, and and when we see something, it opens up a lot of things in our heads for even more and more levels and layers. But if you go to something like AI and be like, I want a movie about, and they give you something, they're going to give you the most generic thing it can possibly uh, think of. And I think without AI, we have enough generic storytelling in the world, and I wouldn't want to add to it. True, true, true. Thank you. And 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 last question to Ashraf as well. Uh, you know, uh, going into the field of animations, but and now now that you are you know trying from your own ways within the country. Uh, and and with given the the uh, spectrum of animation education in the market, how do you think uh, AI would help students or young young storytellers to come up with ideation, even if it's not field lock specific? Because storytelling is story storytelling. You know, a lot of people. Because I I'm also coming from the perspective of of as a as an educator, I've had students. Uh, come up with scripts and, and develop ideas for animations, for you know animated shorts or animated features, but not having that technical capability, what they try to do is go out in the market to see if they can collaborate with someone. For, for, for a dynamic like that, what would be your advice to see like how AI could play a part in pushing the envelope forward to, to bring the industry is closer to collaboration than attacking it from a perspective of a separated um, line of art. I say to students, learn the basics. Know, have a know-how, uh, especially like something like Blender, it's such an amazing piece of software and it's completely free open source. Well, learn that, have that in your, in your knowledge and your arsenal, and then, uh, Take that further with AI. So instead of depending entirely on on AI or prompts or video generators to come up with uh, complete scenarios, you'll always have a, a better advantage if you have the the capability of actually doing the work and and laying the groundwork, and then using AI to develop it further. So I say uh, I say this can help in two ways. On one end, it can help with the early. Uh, conceptualizing work, for example, storyboarding and all. Uh, by the way, I don't think uh, somebody mentioned that it's a uh, an existential threat for like storyboarding artists or uh, 
or or animators for that matter. I don't think it is like that because I get more storyboard work now than what I did when before AI came out. So <clears throat> and and why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Uh, at what, from what, from your perspective, that so so AI effect. is is creating one complete image in in the sense that it understands it. Whereas, like for example, I'll give you a storyboard scenario. The director wants to see a very very particular vision. They want to see a flower in the twinkle of an eye or something very. Uh, the, the blur this and then, you know, angle this and, you know, good luck trying to get AI to get you that exact um, image. So this is where I, I tell, you know, do your uh, initial work. And then it's so if you're good at, at 3D, for example, you can, you can come up with a, with a blocky image and then maybe AI can sort of fill in the rest. So that will that will help. Uh, it'll help you uh, do things faster. So, for example, I'm, uh, you know, most of them, my backgrounds are now uh, uh, AI. I, I I do it in a in a specific style, um, clean it up uh, with with a generation, stick it behind, and you know draw the character in front. And you know, so it's whatever it is, it's like fifty percent faster than what it used to be, right? Uh, and so I don't think it's it's an uh, it's a threat. Uh, in fact, uh, you you had asked uh, Fiona earlier about you know how can artists protect or or photographers protect their artwork. Uh, for me, I think the day AI came out and and your image was was fed into its database, it's it's gone. It's out there. It's it's public domain. It, it's um, you know there's a thing uh, about derivatives. You know this thing. This question has always been uh, among artists. Like you know, so people have always emulate something and then make their own. But then that still is their own artwork. You got inspired by something. So where do the where do you draw the line? You get inspired by a certain art, you create your own. So AI is definitely not a copy of the artwork. It's it's always coming up with something based on the style of a person. If I reach a point where somebody's like Googling, hey, make me an image in, in Ashraf Ghori's style, I'm like, thank you. I'm like, <laughs> I have I have made it. You know, I have become a household name. You know, this is something which uh, you know, for those people who actually have reach that level where, you know, if, if you have a certain style, people want to emulate in a certain style as an, you know, working for an agency or uh, be, uh, before that, it's it's always been a client who comes up and say, hey, I want something that looks like this. It It's it's always been a, a copy. Nobody nobody will ever come up with something so original that it doesn't exist. So same thing with with the artwork, you know, it's like if if your your name is out there and people are developing work in your style it's uh, uh, i think it's a badge of honor and you must have done something right and you're probably doing really well if if you reach that level yeah. awesome thank you well I'll, i'm gonna try it today i'm gonna try and see if i can generate something in Ashraf Gauri style so you it's can not gonna it. happen i'm not there <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, I believe I we're is. running out of time. So I want to thank uh, thank all our panelists uh, today for their insightful contributions. And, and, and now we'd like to open the floor for questions. I believe there are some questions already. This is your opportunity to maybe ask about any topic that you think uh, is going to affect for, in, from your respective field. And please feel free to use the Q&A panel. And, and you can also address it to specific uh, panelists. I already see Steve. Steve King dropping a question. Uh, UAE has strict laws on taking photos and even owning photos of individuals. Any thoughts about if the AI somehow creates an image of you or someone looking like you? Uh, I, I think wild guess here. Fiona, would you like I'll to take guess. Two? Shall I take that one? <laughs> Please. Oh, I, I, I'm going to um, advise caution in the way that you use anything that's created by AI. We've already had quite a few examples of people blindly believing that AI creates things that are real, for example, court cases, it's invented court cases. And uh, so I think if you are going to use AI heavily, please, I mean, it's not that hard to do searches and find out exactly where it does make mistakes it does so please be judicious if you're going to start circulating fake photographs and fake news in the uae you can expect that someone may take um umbrage and come after you so 
and 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 I believe he's followed it up with thank you, Fiona. Another question, which is I, mean, I think it's a two parter, I guess. In the U.S. and the U.K., the Supreme Courts have ruled that creative assets built by AI is not IP and therefore is not protected. What is the local legal position, and is there appreciation of consequences of this? Are there consequences? Steve, uh, what are you trying, first of all? Yeah, geez, Steve, you know, throw me a bone, mate. Um, okay, so um, we don't have any local jurisprudence on this yet. We don't know what the position is locally. Obviously, infringement of copyright is always going to be problematic. We have we have Copyright Act here. It is it is what it is. Um, the, the issue we have here is one of enforcement, and I know that the government is looking at alternative methods of enforcement for copyright breaches. Um, if we're talking about whether or not an AI work is going to be protectable under local law, um, my initial answer wouldn't deviate too much, possibly from the Chinese position rather than the US position. Um, mostly because we're both civil jurisdictions and everything that passes in front of us uh, hangs on the facts of the case in front of us. But um, to be honest, it hasn't been tested here and we don't see a lot of copyright cases here. So it could take a while for us to to see where this goes. Also, Steve, let's have a conversation about this on the side. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Fiona. I, I, saw, I see an interesting question from an anonymous attendee. Do some of you feel pressured to use AI, who wants to take this one? I think we'll. I, I leave it up to you all. Do you feel pressure to use AI? I wonder what this person is going through to have this question because it's definitely a a, a tricky question. Anyone who wants to take it, Ashraf, you want to go? I, I see sure, you raise sure. hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, pressured in a way that um, if you don't get on the bandwagon, you'll be left behind. Uh, in that sense, because I've always been, uh, don't sit on the fence, dive in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, that's, that's good because, you know, that's how I've been, you know, I view it as well. It's in fact, prompt engineering is now becoming a segment, uh, in my classes because I did tell them, you know, it's all about getting ahead of the curve. If you think you're graduating with your graphic design or your film degree, and that makes you special. It, you know, reality is going to hit quite fast. It's also about learning the technology, coming ahead of the curve to see how things come about. So I would say even, even if you think you're pressured to use AI, evaluate for what it is that, that you think AI is, is going to come in and, 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 you know, contribute to your journey and then make your own assessments based off of that. But it definitely should be an arsenal in your tools, in your toolbox. And it, prompt engineering should definitely be thing that that should be broad broadly spoken about across different platforms uh, okay here i think i don't know if this person's asking a tricky question or i see that another anonymous uh, question around about needing to ask ai the right questions isn't the information you give it recorded to the database to be reused for other people's questions isn't it better to not give away information about a project and keep it mostly vague? Woo! Uh, I think, I mean, if you guys have any perspective on it, jump in. But I would say, ultimately, I think what Fiona was talking about was to defend your position of usage of AI versus, yes, of course, it's a language learning model. It's, it, it's going across every database and platform, you know, to rapidly learn and adapt to the whole process. But it also was specifically targeting the part in order to make your work yours truly, rather than just, hey, give me a picture of a man uh, running on the road. What about that generation makes it unique? And it's very much about your thought process. So having that as a record, to kind of see if you are going the direction of using AI to generate art, I believe, your prompt must be saved in order to see and even continue your work accordingly. I guess that brings us, are there any more questions? Uh, hopefully we've answered them all. Anyone else with any question? Any question from the panel? I, uh, I see Amber. a question still there. Uh, from yeah, Dima. Uh, from Dima. I, I also see questions from Dima, but I believe Dima's question is considering the impact of AI advancements. Mm -hmm. Is evident that certain roles in the film industry and design, such as storyboard artists, may be affected. 
Do you anticipate AI driving role transformation in the creative industry and possibly, possibly giving rise to new job roles that better integrate AI tools? I believe Ashraf touched about this, this part from that perspective of storyboarding, but I definitely would love to listen to uh, both Rosanne and Elliot's take on this. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like, to, first off, I'd want to give a shout out to Dima because Dima went to school with me as well. She's in middle sex now. So you, know, you know, you know. Incidentally, D Dima's mentioned this multiple times. I believe you know it's with the SAE. Yeah. And I think it's no second floor and third floor. We always talk about this. So yeah, yeah, nice. yeah, Good yeah. We that. yeah we went to film school together actually. Uh, so um, I would say uh, there is definitely transformation that will happen. As in, I, I think there's gonna be new jobs. Uh, in uh, pre-production and in post-production, uh, especially in VFX uh, and compositing and things like that, you'd have like AI tool integration ma manager, <laughs> things like that. You'll have like these kinds of things. And I think more than that, you'll see new credits. I think uh, AI software users, people who are going to be specializing in uh, prompts and uh, in utilizing the tool, I think we'll start seeing them in film credits as well i think um I, yeah i agree I, I and i don't think it's just localized to ai as well i think we're going to see these advancements within technology themselves and, and how it all uses i mean i often have this conversation with friends of mine who've got kids and i say it's kind of mind-blowing to think that by the time they get to sort of graduation it'll be for roles and careers that don't even necessarily exist anymore right it, it's sort of you know, as the automotive industry moves into AI and autonomous driving cars, you know, car insurance may become a thing of the past because hopefully there'll never be any accidents anymore. So those roles kind of go, but what are the new roles? So I kind of see that, you know, AI and, and all of this sort of stuff moving in a way that will certainly generate um, incredible new opportunities uh, that offer things that we don't necessarily even know what they might be yet. Yeah, awesome. I mean, but like I said, there's there are many ways to uh, uh, see this question in perspective. But I agree with both of you in parts. But I also see it definitely being, um, uh, you know, just understanding the various tools out there and how to even uh, interact with AI should definitely be part of the journey. And everyone, uh, you know, just about getting into the world of AI. I believe. We are almost running out of time. And once again, I'd like to thank all of you, Fiona, Elliot, Razan, Ashraf. Thank you very much for taking the time today. And, and for all the audiences that tuned in, hopefully we've managed to get you guys thinking about these uh, and, and how you could possibly integrate this, integrate this into your workflow. Thank you very much for tuning in and, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Afros. Yeah. Thank you, Afros, for being Thanks, an amazing Margo. MC. Um, that concludes our sessions for today. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. for another lineup of speakers. See you tomorrow. <laughs>